Perfect. Uh, offhand, I don't know how to turn off the waiting room, so I think I might just skip that. Yeah, I don't know if they've changed the use used to be you could only do that when you were actually in your account. You can't do, you couldn't do that live. Yeah. That's what I'm guessing. Um I don't see anybody in the waiting room either. Did we have a topic for this call? I think Jerry said just check in. I haven't seen you in a while, Pete. Uh, yeah, I, I missed last week. Huh? Um, the uh, I, I've been doing the collaborative writing with Markdown and Git thing for a couple weeks, and that was uh, it. It wasn't meant to overlap this call, but it started to overlap. Yeah. Hey, our uh, book is it? Uh, morning, Pete. Uh, sorry, Gil. What, Jerry what? is parking his car. He said he'd be here in three minutes. Our new book is at 50 pages. That's great. <laughs> it's still in the same place. Uh, <laughs> So we've got people joining. It's just um, starting all slow this morning, which is fine. Uh, Stacy, Kevin, we're waiting for Jerry, kind of, and for other people, I guess, too. Uh, Stacy, you're muted. You're still muted uh, on Zoom. I was just saying that I'm trying to get on on my other computer, which I'm having problems with. So this is good. Yeah, I have time. <laughs> Yeah, your background looks all different, which is fun. It's a nice change. Yay, Clea. So we're right. waiting for Jerry, who is parking his car. It's kind of funny. We could be doing check-ins right now. But then it's like, well, if I check in now, then <laughs> Jerry won't be around. And then I'll have burned my check-in spot. So I'm going to wait. <laughs>
it's interesting the uh, anticipated uh, uh, storm system coming through the Gulf of Mexico. You know, the first storm that really made it into the Gulf of Mexico turns into a monster. Which uh, how could it be otherwise with the with the water temperature in the Gulf? Yeah. Stuart, Doug, we're kind of waiting for Jerry. He's parking his car. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I was just watching on the Weather Channel, and they actually were saying that we we kind of lucked out. They, they said like the eye kind of started to collapse just slightly and shortly before it actually came on shore. It could have. It was looked like it was going to intensify well into the category four range. So that's scary. <laughs> we still it's still doing plenty of damage. They also said nine billion dollars worth of damage is what they were estimating in the Guardian article. So. But, but the mayor of Big Bend, who which was one one of the uh, major targets there, came on and. He talked about uh, yeah the intensification of these storms and frequency and so on. You have to believe that climate change has a has a role here, and that's I mean unfortunately and I think everybody knew this. By the time you see it, you know, it's too late to do much about it. You know? Well, except except uh, Mr. DeSantis is doing something about it. He's just turned down a third of a billion dollars of federal climate funding. It's it's incomprehensible. Yeah. What's striking to me is that we measure the damage of the storm in terms of dollars, uh, not in terms of, for example, relationships and lives. Yeah. Not lives lost, but lives so scattered. Uh, yeah. And the cost there is extremely high. Well, you can't measure relationships, therefore it doesn't matter. You can measure crop losses, for example, which no one is talking about. Uh, you can measure social capital, and people are doing it all over the place. That's that's really not accurate. The thing that really bothers me is when the reporters say it's the worst storm since, and then they give mm. a date, which implies that it's cyclical, not a trend. Yeah. And the reporters mm. fall for it. They've got to get that line in. It's the worst thing that happened since 1937. Well, what happened in 1937? I don't know. That's the big flood in New Orleans. That's what 1937 is. There's a great book about it. Mm -hmm. They decided to flood the, the Cajuns and protect New Orleans. Wow. The infamy of history. Uh, sorry for the delay. I am back. Took me a little longer to park and come up here than I thought. Um, how's everybody this morning? Good, good. Kevin, you look like you're in the middle of an alien abduction, just from the lighting on your face and the. Uh... Yeah, I, I thought my I, I need to move. It it, it looks it, yeah, I will move to a you know and I'm back lit and I thought this would get over it, but it's not. That's all right, and I'm I'm actually happy with you looking slightly alienish. It's okay. Um, yeah, it might, it might be more accurate than some other depictions. Um, so anyway. And I thought we would do a check-in style round today. Um, and we can either go with the um, check-ins only until everybody's had a chance to check in. Uh, I will step out and we can step in, basically the S protocol. Shall we do that? Yes. Sounds good. Um, and uh, so, no converse, so don't, let's not be conversational until everyone's had a chance to check in. Uh, I will step out and raise your uh, Zoom electronic hand to take a, a turn in the queue and take your time stepping into the conversation, please. Just give it a, a little pause or a breather between each person so we have a chance to sort of sink into things. With that, uh, I will step out for whoever would like to go first.
Okay, I'll, I'll go first. This has been... <laughs> I didn't plan on going first. But, um, so we, we, we keep working on this Neo book. And uh, in the last meeting, Jerry uh, offered uh, uh, a really unique challenge by saying, let's write an 800-word essay about um, each color about each color we actually had talked about just doing red blue and orange but then as I got into it um, it turns out I had to really cover every uh, color and you know as uh, as as Jerry predicted these are really unique and inter interrelated I mean this came out uh, amazing and so I'm, I just uh, posted this uh, subtitle of the book, you know, the subchapter. So we're getting pretty close to to wrapping up a coherent story on this. But the the um, um, the reason why I'm I'm mentioning this, we had uh, an an interesting exchange uh, on our on our email. Um, and with Jessica, and she's not here, so I'm. I'm uh, I would. I would love to. I mean, we we went offline to to exchange a couple more emails, but there came up this issue of morality, and um, and the idea that living systems principles don't include morality as an issue. You know, living systems principles. Um, uh, are somehow designing a, 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 a better way of designing uh, for good models than than a, a morality, which somehow seems to be political and a distraction. And that really, um, um, particularly when you look at this within the context of our evolutionary principles, you know, of understanding how we build cohesion in a society, in, in, in community, seems to be something that that deserves further exploration because if people quoting AI reject the idea of morality as a guiding principle, then we have a then we have a disconnect you know in in how we use metaphors to uh, to create meaning and meaning making in my mind um, because the 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 biggest issue we have in our form of capitalism is that we have alienated entire uh, uh, groups within within the society um, to be to be uh, uncoupled right from the from the regular uh, economy, and in order to change that, you would have to build inherently less efficient forms of of uh, economic structures that assist or, or that, that pull in people um, uh, who don't have you know, particular technical skills and, and uh, uh, great forms of productivity. So I, I, I just, um, and, and it's so, and we, you know, we had this exchange going back and forth where you're saying amoral automatically defaults into immoral because by definition, if you want to make a decision divorced from morality, you will always default into what is most profitable, you know, most uh, ef most efficient, most uh, uh, you know, in 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 most favorable, you know, in advancing, and 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 you would ignore uh, by default, you would ignore people who are getting uh, disadvantaged by these decisions, and that's what we see is really happening, and. If that is so deeply ingrained in the orange part of the population, really, you know, uh, uh, then then we'll have we'll have a problem going forward uh, with these designs because they will continue to alienate you know the, the groups of people in the name of efficiency and productivity and uh, you know, advancing uh, the, our our models here. So that's. I, I would you know, throw that out as a discussion point that you know, we should have a, a better understanding of morality and as, as a as a self-serving principle, you know another way of putting it is altruistic uh, is is uh, reciprocal altruism is another term that has been floating around. It's completely self-serving, right because um, 
if your neighbors, I mean, you see it in every community, you know, if you have homeless people living in tents under bridges um, uh, and, and, and uh, striving to, to get food and, 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 you know, fight for basic survival, that's not a good thing for your community. So it is completely self-serving in, in, that, in, that, in that sense. So anyway, that was sort of my um, my 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 way my pondering for for the day here. Uh, Kevin, Thank you're you. muted. In case you think we're hearing you. I will check in. Thank I you. wanna I wanna flawed premise and you're buying into a bad story. Uh, and that's just another thing. I'm working on a, as Kevin, I you're... mentioned river personhood. Uh, and that's a way yeah. Um, Can you hear me? Your audio is janky for me. Everything got compressed up. Uh, okay, so everybody had trouble hearing you uh, at the start here. You might want to just start your your thought over and reconsider yeah. where you're sitting. Uh, you're sounding okay now. Make make some noise, and I, I think I'm hearing let you. Let me let me put on some headphones and see if that. When I go from that may have been the wrong button to press. The, the phrase uh -huh. when I vanish altogether. I, I think he I think he hit the eject button and he's out of the cockpit now. It seems like a metaphor for modern life, isn't it? Look, here he comes back. Yay! He made it back. Can, should I jump in again? Yes, floor is yours. Okay. Well, uh, one I want to. Uh, doubt and be willing to debate Klaus's basic premise that the dehumanizing is more efficient and more productive. And that, I won't go there. I just think it's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a bad story to buy into. Uh, I, I've been working on, uh, as I mentioned last week, river personhood. And that's a thing where in, in our county, for example, if Duke Power wants to frack, which they do, and they want to have fracking ponds with uh, toxic stuff in them, it's illegal in North Carolina to look into what's in those ponds. You can't do that. Duke has that kind of power. If you had a river personhood on behalf of the Swannanoa River, you could look into um, the, uh, the waste there. And uh, towns and counties are doing it all over. Ecuador's decision last week to stop a mining project was also uh, done by the same group, Center for Environmental Legal Defense Fund, and they they built the premise on it. And they don't, but economic justice is not on their agenda. I'm talking to them, and we want to probably have a local group because it's a linear task and people can get behind pushing it. And it's, you know, a lot of incremental wins like it was for civil rights or women's rights or gay rights, small things that, that you know, what like Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a great strategist on that, but Thurgood Marshall was, and what's her name with gay rights, but a lot of small things that aren't like Roe v. Wade that, you know, Ginsburg made it okay for women to have checkbooks and to have credit cards and to own a deed and to own title to land, that kind of small things. But they, you know, they said there is uh, one community where there is some ethnic diversity, but it's not an issue. And there's another group called River Network, which is all about climate justice. And so I'm talking to both of those groups and I'm wanting the folks doing climate justice, you know, which is how everybody gets shot upon if you're poor downstream, uh, don't have the tool uh of river personhood which can give them status so i'm trying to link those two groups so that's that's where i'm going
And I think, Doug, you're pausing intentionally, but just in case, just to remind everybody of the protocol, you've raised your hand, so you're next in the queue, and take as long as you wish to step in um, to the conversation. Thanks. Uh, but do you will have to unmute yourself. Just to, to Kevin share, um, I don't know whether whether you're familiar with the, the the Lake Erie Bill of Rights case, um, where there was a a Lake Erie Bill of Rights granted to Lake Erie. Um, by the citizens of uh, Toledo, and um, in the case, it's it's Drew's Farms P. Ship the City of Toledo. Um, it was considered this huge victory because it was basically acknowledging the lake's right to exist, sort of a fundamental natural right, um, and um, the judge basically overruled it and dismissed it because um, that concept was just too broad as a law in its potential imposition projection on people that would infringe on that right to exist in a clean, healthy, you know, sustained, you know, regenerative, sustainable, vital way. Um, because human beings uh, didn't have certainty in, in things they could or couldn't do that would violate it. And intrinsic in that, just to loop it full circle, uh, to class's share, um, the underlying, you know, essential knowing on a morality and values level answers that, like has the ability to guide that, to inform that. Our legal system is not a moral system. No. <laughs> Our legal system is a system designed for enforcement of rules and laws and to prescribe penalties for violating them. But there isn't a morality dimension to our legal system. It doesn't exist. It's, it's about force and power over and compliance. And morality is the missing agree ingredient, I think. Yeah, I'm really familiar with that decision. There's been a lot of them since then. One of the things that seems That's, to be happening. We're not, there's we're, a, not, we're not in conversation mode right now. I apologize. Okay, sorry. Yeah, okay, if you can just hold this thought and come back in when everybody's checked in. And, sure. and Doug, you sort of brought this on by responding to everybody else, but that's okay. I just want to interrupt because I'm trying to obey the, the protocol we've agreed to. Right, okay, no problem. Thanks. So whoever else would like to go and check in, please raise your hand and... Step right in. So I guess this is me. Um, I have been working on a, a framework of frameworks for my own interest for about I don't know, a couple of years now. And I decided to turn it into a book, which is more of a collection of pages explaining all the hundred elements or so. But I was having trouble writing it because I didn't have a chunk of time to devote to this section. So what I started to do was I had an outline. I already knew my content because I've been researching it and thinking about it for a couple of years. 
And I would dictate into my phone when I was doing other things. It happened to be, if I was going on an errand and I was going to be in the car for 10 minutes, I would just put my phone in this little spot and hit record. And I would just riff on the next section in the outline. So it was five minutes here, 10 minutes here. I'd sometimes do it when I was walking, sometimes on a riding a bike, because I like to ride bikes with no hands. I think that's fun. Um, so what ended up happening is in six months, I had 35,000 words. And now I'm in the process of editing. And I think that that is a viable way to write something if you are stuck trying to write something of any size and it feels overwhelming. The, the dictating into your phone while doing something else is it's conversational. You're, it's like you're explaining it. You're thinking through it while you're, while you're saying the words. And it's just something I wanted to share because it's worked exceedingly well for me. So that's all. Okay, I can check in since nobody else has got their hand raised. I said, why bother? Um, so a few interesting occurrences this week. Um, I don't know if, if Gil was the one or um, I did it myself. Fernando Flores uh, is offering this new program called Mobilizing. And I was really kind of curious about what he was um, offering. Um, I studied with him in 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 the around 1990. Um, took a long program with one of his disciples, but was exposed to his work, and his work has been great and informative. Um, and so I went to a a um, an informational Zoom. And it sounded kind of interesting um, talking about mobilizing in the current world. And my 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 one concern in the background was, you know, is is this mobilizing um, to make our organizations more effective, current organizations, uh, or is it mobilizing for a new world in some ways? So I had a a, a further interview with one of his. Staff people, and you know, I talked about what I'm sitting in in terms of my concerns as I look out in the world, and you know, he was with me and with me, <laughs> and then I, and then I asked what the cost of this year long program would be. <laughs> I see Ken laughing, and it was eighteen grand, <laughs> and. <laughs> Where where my mind goes with that is you're the fucking problem. <laughs> you're the fucking problem. You're this brilliant, wonderful, beautiful guru who's probably got more money than he ever possibly needs, and you're the fucking problem. <laughs> so I just have to have to laugh <laughs> at that one. Um, <clears throat> so that's that's one occurrence of the week. Um, the second occurrence of the week is um, working on um, what has come to be in my own thinking, you know, a neo book, a combination of, you know, things that I see that, are, that need attention 
as we do our best to remake the world in some sense. Um, my poetry and my models for getting to relationship, for having collaborative conversations and creating sustainable collaborations. And um, just when you're in conversation with other people, you realize, you know, how much how much you're missing. Um, so in one of the calls I was on, I realized that in my 33 things, what I forgot, and, and Klaus was on the call, one of the things I forgot was dealing with sustainable agriculture, which is such a critical and foundational piece. So this whole notion of, of being in relationship and being in dialogue uh, is just so, so critical because it informs our thinking. Um, yeah. Um, and we actually had a good discussion about that, you know, using the work of Angelus Arian to allow yourself to be informed by what you hear. But one of the things that I said was missing in the, the, 120, 130 page manuscript I had so far was um, this fable that I'm creating for what the world might look like if you applied some of these uh, uh, principles and models. And um, I hadn't looked at the manuscript in a few weeks. And when I sat down to, to work on it and work on this fable, I went, oh yeah, part of the fable is. So what's the agreement among the hundred sovereigns who uh, just think there's no hope for where we are and where we're going. What's the agreement they might come to? And I'm I'm starting to have a lot of fun um, playing with the nuance uh, of that. Um, so that, that's been a good thing. And I appreciate the, the opportunity to be engaged in that vehicle. Um, and the third thing is um, I've been in conversation for a number of years with a guy who is a future former president of the World Future Society. He's in South Carolina. He spent his life, he's, he's now in his 80s, and he's kind of run out of money um, because he spent his life after selling a, a family textile business um, engaged with the future. And um, he's created this network um, and has been working on this project for years called the Communities of the Future. He was originally uh, focused on economic development of regional um, areas and and new kinds of leadership. But you know he's come to realize that all right, we're in a collapsing world. How can I use this network going forward? And it's so congruent with organizing on a regional level. So um, I've got. Rick, and we've done some writing together to um, gather people from regions all over the country um, and internationally to really talk about. So um, where are we going? What's going on? And there's some very interesting folks uh, on it. So I'll be facilitating that conversation sometime. And, and my thinking is, ah, Let's kind of expand this thinking and see if we can't create um, more um, regional folks interested in where the world is. Um, and more and more, I see that people are, you know, um, engaged in where the world is. So, um, and it's really interesting. And, and Jerry, I'm sure you experienced some of this also. Um, Jennifer's in Singapore for almost three weeks working, <laughs> and it's it's interesting to step back into, even though we don't live together, but it's it you know all the time. It's interesting to step back into uh, that space for an extended period, not just for for four or five days. Um, I'm rather enjoying it. <laughs> Thank you all for the opportunity to speak. So I'm uh, feeling that our reluctance to join in uh, to our self-declarations is kind of unusual for this group. Uh, 
I think if you look around the screen, this is the kind of the core group with a lot of horsepower. And like most groups, we're not able to take on uh, the coming climate change. Uh, and it's a little bit like the movie Don't Look Up, except instead of an asteroid, it's climate. And we're sort of stuck. Uh, I think I'll just stop there. Um, uh, for me, just a kind of a side comment, but something that's been sort of a, an earworm, brainworm, uh, made a new friend in our building a couple weeks ago, and he sort of reminded me of Christopher Hitchens' kind of brilliance, and I've been watching clips of him interviewed or on panels or talking in front of audiences and all that, and um, when he has someone or something in his sights, he is uh very direct and uh like crisp in his critique um so if you don't like his style you're really not going to like his style but i like i love the crispness and humor <clears throat> sort of love humor but but <clears throat> very sharp hand with which he delivers his uh messages so uh there's just a whole bunch of chris hitchens online uh he died of cancer unfortunately uh, and is is does does atheism sign a, sort of uh, uh, some credit in the ways he explains his stance relative to um, other things and other people? So that's been it, it. Just keeps popping into my head a lot of the things that he that he says, and and in particular the the way he says things, which I really admire. Um, Scott, we're not in the conversational part of the session yet, uh, and I'd love to hear more about what you're talking about. So we want to wait for people to check in, but I want to question our protocol because last time, Doug, last time we did the S protocol in particular, where I step out and I don't manage people coming in, we were very reluctant to come in and I was really puzzled by it. <clears throat> and we're sort of doing it again. It's like, if we're not, we're not all just like, oh, lining up and, and jumping into check-in so that we can talk we're being uh, real sort of slow to do it. So I wanted to uh, maybe ask the group how you all feel about the protocol. And what happened was the following check-in call, I just ran it my old style way, which was I just called people in and we sort of went through it pretty briskly. Uh, but I'm okay with whatever the group likes. So I'll go quiet again. So uh, I'm not reluctant, I'm patient. And I don't know how it is for other people, but I'm kind of appreciating the different pace of the call um, <clears throat> and the opportunity for breathing and reflection. And I'm, I'm kind of amused, Jerry, that you're uncomfortable since the Quaker meeting is a meme that you bring up often with with what I, with what I experience as great admiration and affection. It seems to have had a profound effect for you. You appreciate it a lot. And here we're doing something like that. And uh, so for me, it's not reluctance. So uh, I guess that's a vote for doing the S process from, that, from time to time. And thank you, uh, Miss S, for that. Um, and since I have the floor, I'll... Um, 
I'll check in on two things. I don't think I, I gave an update uh, last time. Did, did I give an update last time about, about Jane's um, uh, cancer journey? So let me just say there, um, she's been uh, put on a new regime as of July, just, just approved in October. Um, uh, Stuart, not relevant for you just yet. This is only for people who've been through four or five um, cycles of other stuff and relapsed. Um, but it's been it, it it's extremely sophisticated um, medically because it's a, a monoclonal antibody that targets two proteins on the surface of the specific cancer cell and attracts your immune system to them. So it's a kind of um, you know activate your immune system rather than kill the cancer cell strategy. Um, her critical blood markers have gone like this you know for 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 years like like that now have gone off the bottom of the chart um and um and um the effect on her mood as well as her physical well-being is stunning like mo mojo back for the first time in years kind of cool um so that's one story and um on the um on the private equity for good front, um, people who don't know, I'm looking to uh, build a machine to acquire uh, small and medium sized climate relevant companies from retiring owners and um, raise their value, improve their effectiveness. Um, Stuart, in fact, using some of the work of Flores and, and Chauncey Bell in doing that uh, and put them in the hands of their employees as employee owned companies, whether co-ops or ESOPs or trusts or something like that. Um, the pipeline process, finding the companies has been very slow and remains slow. We've looked at a couple, we've, um, not proceeded, but are continuing to look. Um, <clears throat> but recently, um, I think some really breakthrough work in the design of the, um, um, acquisition process and financial um, system to be designed because in contrast to a usual deal where there's two parties and you have to do a deal that's reasonably fair for both parties uh, we have four or five parties in the deal we have the owner who's selling we have us who's buying we have our investors we have the new employees who become the new owners and of course the living world as the container for it all and we will only do deals that are beneficial to all five so it's complicated and may be complex. And we've had some conversations in last week with some new allies who um, who appear to have a really elegant way of framing and addressing and transacting uh, that kind of challenge. So I'm newly invigorated on that. Um, and uh, and I have a question for you all. So there's a there's a game that came out of Stanford and I guess in the nineties that has become widespread in the United States in business schools called, uh, called a uh, search fund where uh, an investor stakes a newly bint, minted MBA to a year or two to go find a company to buy and then stakes him or her to buy the company. And then they earn out their ownership through their leadership of the company e entrepreneurship through acquisition ETA. Um, <clears throat> and it's a thing and it's an interesting thing. Um, and I'm, sort of noodling on is there is there a three-letter acronym for the thing that we're doing which is like you know ownership through something or uh, i invite your all cleverness about that not to discuss now stick it in the chat send me notes um i think you know <clears throat> um from where i sit the notion of broadening ownership uh, is an important piece of the puzzle whether we are collapsing or not um and collapse is going to be Collapse is going to be unevenly distributed, like just like the future is unevenly distributed. So this appears to be a game that's got a lot of power for a lot of reasons, connecting to the community work, Stuart, that you were talking about, and Kevin, that you were deeply immersed in. Um, and so, um, yeah, so my request is for a little bit of branding creativity on that. And um, that's my check-in. Thanks all. Um, I'm a bit trepidatious. Uh, I raised my hand kind of to respond to Jerry's uh, question about um, 
the, the format. And Gil, I exactly what you said is how I felt. Um, I really like the little bit slower rhythm and I love being quiet together. Um, uh, I have a weird check-in. Uh, I wanted to do like a minute or two minutes. I wanted to do like two minutes of show and tell. Um, the, the thing that's super alive for me right now is uh, our good friends, AI friends, uh, ChatGPT, and, uh, and right now it's mid-journey for me, uh, an image synthesizer. Um, I, can, I can say I had a really great experience uh, with ChatGPT um, coaching somebody through a fairly tricky uh, data analysis kind of thing. Um, it's somebody who's savvy about, you know, tech and, but he's not a programmer, but he's had some programming experience and he's got this massive spreadsheet, literally dozens and dozens of columns uh, that's come in from data collection. Uh, this is part of a, a sense maker process um, uh, where they're collecting stories from the field and the stories get marked up with some metadata that helps you collate them together and, and, um, uh, uh, it's, it's, it, there's, there's a, a ton of data to kind of like grab the qualitative things and synthesize it. And, um, just managing the data is a big deal. So we wrote some Python programs together, uh, mostly chat GPT writing Python programs together to kind of pull this stuff out of the, out of the spreadsheets and then do stuff with it. It's amazing. So, um, that's not the show and tell. The show and tell part uh, is some, I, I wanted to show off uh, 17 mid German images, kind of random pretty ones from the last couple of weeks. Um, I have literally generated 11,000 or something like that mid journey images in the last three weeks. Um, so I'm always at, the, at my phone out in the world doing mid journey stuff. So um, I appreciate your forbearance in watching this if you're not enchanted um, and you, you don't have to be enchanted, but uh, let me share my screen and uh, we'll see how this goes. Uh, this is a, an image thing that I will do full screen. Uh, so one of the things I really like about uh, these synthesized images are the colors and the textures and the, and the depth of field. This is actually not even the prettiest uh, little glass uh, candle thing that, that I have, but this is a, a nice one. It's got that nice flame glow thing. Um, uh, almost real plumerias. Um, I can't decide quite if I like the almost real part of this or not, but um, again, colors and textures and stuff like that. Um, I love these kind of atmospheric uh, things. Um, part, of, part of my hope here is that some of these things will look different than what you think AI art looks like. Um, uh, Midjourney is spectacular at generating um, all kinds of uh, Mandela shaped things. Um, I, and I, it's still mind blowing to me that it's good at doing this um, um, uh, uh, symmetry stuff. Uh, it's really good at it. And this, again, probably isn't the best one. It's got nice colors and pops, but um, uh, I, I love this little miniature bonsai city thing. Um, I like miniature stuff, and this just is enchanting the way it's got a bonsai and a city. It's super cool. Um, I, again, faces. Faces are really good. And of course, when you're doing mid-journey a, 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 an occupational hazard of mid-journey and of course an occupational hazard of being somebody who, lo who looks at mid-journey images is you see ton of tons of uh, super attractive young beautiful women so it's it's really fun to also know that it can do um, things that aren't uh, super attractive young beautiful women so I think this guy is still super attractive super cool um, I guess I really like textures and colors and stuff and the depth of field on this one is super cool too. Um, it's, it's good at textures and colors. Um, I, I love uh, this, for some reason, these, uh, one of the things that I'm enjoying most about Mid Journey is the way it comes up with sets of colors that just make me happy. This might not be a set of colors that makes you happy, but this, just looking at this makes me happy. So there's a bunch of images like that from Mid Journey. Um, I guess I also like miniature stuff. Um, I, I also like, uh, these are Kokeshi dolls, um, it turns out from Japan. Um, I like the little hand painted details here. And of course it's synth synthetic hand painted, but um, I still think it's cool. 
there's a weird thing where it doesn't quite go forward. And um, these are kind of Matryoshka dolls from uh, Russia. And again, the, the hand-painted detail and some of the focus stuff, some of the things are a little bit more focused and less in focus. That just enchants me. And then this is the last one here, if we can get to it. Um, I still don't know what this is, but I was like, wow, that's cool. So another thing that just makes me happy to look at. So there you go, show and tell. Thanks. Pete, what program are you using again? Uh, this is. This particular one is Midjourney uh, five point two. One of the one of the, the one of the tricks with Midjourney is almost any image it makes is gorgeous, beautiful. So then there's you you end up um, you end up finding the really trite ones. There's a bunch of things that generates over and over for everybody, kind of. So one of the the things that I'm trying really hard to to do is look for the ones that aren't found easily, if that makes sense. Um, ChatGPT is the same way, by the way, Klaus. Um, it's it always does beautiful language. So one of the enchanting things about it is that it always does beautiful languages. Language. So then the trick is to get beyond just the beauty of it to a little bit of novelty and and innovativeness and stuff like that. Okay, I'll check in. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm feeling stuck in the way that I probably felt for the past five or six years. Um, because again, I'm focused on the politics. And um, a couple of days ago, so some, most of you know that I'm in North Carolina with a friend who's lost her husband. And different people are stopping over and they're of the other political persuasion. 
So I, you know, and I know that before we even talk, but a, a very nice man came over yesterday and he um, worked for IBM. He was an intelligent man. And he, so, you know, we talked a little bit, we didn't get into politics, but he mentioned that on Twitter, you know, I started talking to him about AI, you know, and I just mentioned, you know, I, I hear a little bit, I understand a little, and that was a nice place for us to start. So he told me how he was on Twitter and there was this um, video and it was Hillary endorsing DeSantis. And he, we both laughed and we both like, you know, knew that that was ridiculous. But what it triggered for me is that a couple of days earlier, I had watched this not very public Trump video and I got it off of a Trumpers page. You know, it was like, it's not something that any one of you would have in your feeds. And what really bothered me is that as I, if it was anybody else's voice, I would have found it to be uplifting and motivating and absolutely beautiful to the point that I had never heard him speak like that before. And my first thought is, this is really scary. But after speaking to him, I started thinking that might not even be him. And that brings me back to this state of confusion that I feel like I've been living in which is sometimes it's exciting and other times it's just like, let me off, <laughs> let me off. So that's, that's my check-in. Oh, one more thing. I just went to get coffee when I went off camera and because we have a visitor here, just so you know what I'm dealing with. This woman is explaining, is modeling for my friend how she prays for our country and going through the whole dialogue. And this is somebody that believes everything that Trump says. So it's just so, and, and I'm listening to her words, how she's praying to be shown the truth. And it's just, it's really been hard for me to be here. And Stuart mentioned to me last week that he saw it in my face, how difficult it's been. So thank you for letting me share. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> I've got to go. I'd love to <clears throat> jump in on, I think it was the Lake Erie case on river personhood. And there've been a lot of them since then. One of the things that's most interesting is there's this town in Pennsylvania that passed a bill that was basically a town uh, bill of rights, if you will, that would stop a pipeline that is a, a major player in that town uh, where the stuff is produced. And they did it 10 times and got it squashed by the state. And at the 10th time, they, they passed a thing in the, whether it was the, the city, or the, the U.S. attorney or whatever, they, you, you couldn't file that kind of suit. And the, uh, the pipeline gave up. They said, if people are this much against it, we just won't it's not going to be worth it. The cost is gone. And so you know, that's how this stuff is going forward. You need a group of people who are pursuing this cause and then they stay with it persistently until they give up, you know, and that's, uh, they, they never got the legal right there, but they got it stopped through passing it 10 times and getting their local ordinance shot down. So anyway, that's, that's how this stuff went. That's all. I think it's just Carl and Kevin left. I mean, Carl and Ken left and Judy. Okay, well, I guess I'll go um, then. Um... Just in the past month, I've taken, I've done two workshops around storytelling. Uh, one Dan Rome, and he's got a new book out, Pop Up Pitch, which kind of uh, put ten slides together, and it um, basically is the hero's journey, um, the thing. And then another, uh, another um, course. On, um, there's a. Michael Margolis and Get Storied. And uh, 
then with, um, it's interesting to hear of so many people with writing and stuff too, because I got um, back into um, Zettelcast, looking at Zettelcast and and um, actually looking to, um, actually going to start out with um, uh, putting together a little Zettelcast and brain figuring out the like tags and thought types and stuff and then have that be able to import that into some of my other brains then. Um, and then with all the climate change stuff too, as some of you probably know, um, Jeff Conklin, but he had the, with, um, he had, um, well, he studied like course riddle and the whole issue-based information systems. There was a tool compendium that, uh, that he, he developed these, he was in Copenhagen and developed these huge dialogue um, maps and things, but it's like there's a whole question, idea, pros and cons, and you can really um, put together things. So I want to really look back at that. I'm looking to really get and enhance my toolkit for getting back into my um, dissertation research. So it's kind of where I've been uh, the past few weeks. So, uh, hello, everybody. Um, my big project at the moment is planning my trip to Italy coming up in October. And uh, it's thrilling. I uh, have an itinerary and know where we're going to go uh, around Tuscany. And it's incredibly frustrating to find flights. Um, you go online and it says, oh, yeah, here's a flight from $501. And you click on that. And um, there's no check-in, uh, advanced check-in. There's no carry-on bag lab. There's no meal and there's no seat assignment. You are the last to board and you just get randomly assigned. Um, and if you actually want to have any of those things, oh, and no check to bag, it's $180 for your first check bag, $180 for a check bag. So if you want any of those things, it actually starts at around $750 to $800. And um, I called the travel agent and, you know, she gave me a quote and um, said, but, you know, we charge $50 per ticket because we don't make any money ticketing. So there's that's another hundred dollars on it. And it's, it's just like, it's so deceptive. You know, you think you're going to get this great deal and you start clicking around for these great deals and they all end up costing 15, 18, $2,000, $1,500, $2,000. So just, I'm, I'm finding myself really drained by it. Um, and I was lamenting with a friend of mine yesterday, too many choices is actually a horrible thing. Um, there's so much choice out there for so many things. I remember years ago I had the flu and I was really in bad shape at a temperature 102 and I woke up in the middle of the night coughing I couldn't stop coughing so I got into the car and drove down to the 24-hour pharmacy and I was looking for some cough syrup and there was a wall of cough syrup choices in front of me there had to be like 80 different choices and my brain's not working and it's in the middle of the night and I'm like I just want some freaking cough medicine to stop coughing you know and I, I had to go and ask somebody what do you recommend and they said grab that one I'm like okay you know and I'm chugging it in when I get out in my car and just I, I, I sometimes look at what's going on with, with, you know, all the choices and think there's just, it's, it's not a good thing to have this many choices, you know? Um, I think it really impedes our well being. And I'm working on a couple of uh, uh, projects right now around well being, where well being of individuals intersects with well beings of groups, with organizations, and with society and the planet. So um, that's kind of on my, my mind. Um, but I am getting excited to go to Italy and, um, uh, you know, it's, it's becoming real that, you know, we're going to check it out, see if it's a place you might want to retire. Um, and if so, then I'll be going back in the spring and trying to find a place. So it's also very daunting to the thought of, Oh my God, packing up, you know, our house and, and moving it and just like, Oh, it's, it's huge psychological hurdles there. Um, so taking it one step at a time. Um, other than that, I'm good. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day. I said, how are you doing? And he says, if I take out the things I'm not in control of, I'm doing great. And I just, I love that line. <laughs> I'm doing great as long as I don't focus on the things I can't control. But as soon as my mind goes there, it's like, oh my God, you know, look what's happening and how, how 
you know, challenging things are. Um, so that's me. Thank you for listening. And Judy, I think you're the only person left who hasn't checked in. If you'd like to, uh, feel free to do so now, and then we can switch into conversational mode for our last little stretch here. Apologies for coming in late. Um, I really resonate with what Ken is saying about well-being. I've been spending a lot of time trying to sort through things that need to be dealt with, decluttering the house, eliminating things, and giving to donations and things, so things that I really they're not adding to my enjoyment of my current space. And if I want to move to my condo in Kansas City at some point, I certainly can't take all the things in the house. So I'm in a major uncluttering mode physically, which then leads to some uncluttering mentally. <laughs> and I've been involved with a lot of different nonprofits. I'm trying to simplify that list a little bit and focus on the things where I can actually contribute something that seems to be helpful to a group of people or an organization. So kind of just a reflective mode, trying to sort out. <laughs> a friend of mine used to say, Judy, when you say that, you're always trying to figure out the rest of your life. So don't say it's this new thing you're doing. Um, but it is kind of a continuous mode in both, you know, doing the things that bring you joy and doing the things that are helpful to some good cause of, or another. That's about all I can say, really. Love that, Judy. Thank you. And thank you all for, for checking in. Class, off to the races. Yeah, I I, uh, I went to a meeting yesterday here in Bend because I'm really trying to get into the community and understand you know, what, what, uh, how, how, how we can uh, engage and assist at a, at a real uh, practical level. And I went to a meeting of the local climate tech group. And, you know, we're about maybe 12 people or so there. They're all in their 30s, you know, late 20s, 30s, and so on, younger folks. And I gave a, a, an overview of what's happening in, the, in agriculture, um, considering that one third of global emissions are caused to agriculture and so on. And I, and I showed them a report from McKinsey they did a study to the World Economic Forum on the future of food uh, through technology. And it was amazing. And, and then I also pointed out that there is an enormous shortage of technical supporters uh, in, the, in the food system. Uh, and there's all these innovations coming in, there's all these changes coming in. And it was the, 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 it was so warmly received, right? Because they're all struggling to find out where they should be going, you know, in the face of AI coming into their space and, and, and with uh, so many changes and layoffs in different areas, right? So, so I thought um, that is really, you know, fertile grounds to, to help younger professionals um, to see where they could uh, slide in to um, to make a difference, and at the same time build their careers. I started out by saying I'm 73 years old, and I can't tell you I don't even remember how many times I had to change my skill set and acquire new ways of doing things in the process. I gave them the the example of the Excel spreadsheet, you know, to sort of equate what's happening with AI right now. It's just a tool; use it you now. And, and and get bet, get good at it faster than anybody else and it will advance your career and this sort of thing. So I was super encouraged, you know, by um so, so they're all coming to this panel discussion and kiss the ground screening that uh, that I've been organizing with the local citizen climate chapter. And that's I think is a good point, a good place to engage. You know, so I was really uh I, I was really chassed up, you know, coming coming out of this uh, evening yesterday. Love that. Sounds awesome. Um, Doug Van Stewart. So I'm going to respond to uh, Peter's uh, uh, diagrams, which are beautiful, uh, and with a slight challenge, and that is I have a painting of my own uh, that's on my clipboard, and I want to see if I can screen share. 
doesn't want to do it. What's wrong? Do you have it open as an image? You can just go to share screen and Zoom. Uh, you can either paste it into the chat, because I think our chat is enabled to paste files, or you can open it in image preview or whatever platform you're on, and then just do sc share screen and show us that. Um, I give up for the moment. <laughs> Can't make it work. Shoot. Um, Stuart. Yeah, a couple of couple of comments, couple of thoughts. Um, when Ken was talking about um, too many choices, <laughs> it it evokes for me um, the first chapter of my basic economic textbook as a freshman at Syracuse University. And it talked about, um, and I can't remember who had written it, whose textbook it was. This is in 1964. Um, it talked about the fact that the United States was in a tertiary economy. And what that meant was that approximately two thirds of the cost of goods sold were all about um, marketing and packaging. And um, my brain immediately went to, well, that's a really inefficient way to use resources. You know, how dumb is that? And I don't know what those percentages are today, but I would imagine that it's it's greater because you have so much, uh, uh, such a, a, a higher level of the proliferation of, um, you know, high-end luxury goods, um, you know, and that 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 I think is part of the part of the whole problem in terms of or part of the challenge in terms of consumption of resources and how much um, people's identity is tied up in 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 these in these brands. Um, just just you know, huge. Um, Ken, the other thought is in Italy. If you go to uh, Florence, the Medici tombs, which is not considered a huge tourist attraction, but to me it was one of the most powerful experiences I've ever had walking into the Medici tombs. And so it's interesting, there are six mausoleums in a hexagon shaped tomb that you walk downstairs to. And um, there are you know six sarcophagi but only three statues. And when I was there last time, you know, a few years ago, I said to the docent, I said, so what happened to the other three statues? Thinking that they had been, you know, lent out to some other museum or, you know, uh, uh, or had been destroyed by marauders or something. And he turned to me, he said, they ran out of money. <laughs> <laughs> which I just thought was absolutely hysterical that the Medici family ran out of money to build the additional six statues. <laughs> and, and in mausoleums, which are sort of long-term thinking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So Stacy, I wanted to just say in terms of focusing on politics, the reason that it the reason that it's crazy making is because they're all fucking nuts. <laughs> they're adhering to an, ide an ideology and they're not engaged in wisdom conversations or dialogue. And that's why it's kind of crazy making to try and think um, that this is kind of a, 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 a some rational way forward in its current configuration. And that's what makes you, you know, that's what makes us crazy that's why i've kind of you know just disengaged from taking them seriously because they're just in a tribal uh, warfare over there um yeah so thank you mm -hmm. and stacy i have a feeling that part of what enables you to engage with people on the op opposite side of the political spectrum is not considering them crazy right <laughs> It helps. <laughs> yeah, so I'm wondering, like, if you want to reflect on that for a little bit. Yeah, because because you're more than any of us. Um, try, you've been trying very hard to talk and listen and to engage, um, which is great. 
Well, two things I want to say on that. The in-person stuff, it's harder because I can do it in the beginning when it's, you know, an even slate and I could bring up things like I mentioned before, like the food system where we can totally agree upon. I can talk about the joke in Congress. I could do that. But I, I just want to go back because back in 2015 and 2016 on Facebook, it was very different than it is now. And back then I really saw potential to do something. And apparently the Republicans or the Russians or whoever it was, they were utilizing that potential and we weren't. And I was trying desperately to get people to work with me to do the same things that they were doing. And I had a couple of people where we would go together into groups, talk offline about how we'd handle the situation very nicely and interject facts because it's so important what you hear going on around you. And then, of course, I stopped and I hardly do that at all. But recently I've gone back, especially now that I'm not home and I don't have to worry for my safety. But recently I've gone back into community groups because some of these people, it's very clear that they are just looking to stir up trouble. It's just very clear. And so I will start answering with facts because I know from talking to the people in person, they really genuinely haven't heard these things. So one of the things I'm focused on right now is, you know, everybody's upset about fentanyl. They keep throwing fentanyl on you. So uh, that's the, the opportunity to say, to talk about Giuliani creating the sweetheart deal for Purdue and how the Sackler family didn't have, or, or the corporate executives didn't have to face criminal charges. And they'll be like, well, what, we don't know what you're talking about. And then they can go and look it up. And that's where we can unite. But, so I'm sorry, I'm rambling, but I have nobody else to talk to. <laughs> um, but in these community pages, I've had people come up because once I say something, they all come out of the woodwork, just with insults, not with any kinds of facts. And it's really like debating fourth graders. They're, they really, there's nothing intelligent going on there. And other people will say, you know, I really appreciate you doing this, and but they're not listening. And I, my point is, they may not be listening, but there are onlookers that are reading that have never heard this. And mm -hmm. I put the articles there. I don't just say, this is what happened. And I'm very careful to make sure that what I'm putting up is based on fact. So like, there is definitely something that I'm calling TPS, which is Trump Persecution Syndrome. And you would be amazed at how many of these 30% of true believers really feel like this poor man is being railroaded. So I want them to see how Ruby Freeman's life was destroyed. I want them to see that. So again, I wish there were more people on social media just having respectful conversations because they're not hearing, first of all, many of them have left Facebook because they've been told not to listen. So anyway, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thanks, Stacey. Thank you. Uh, since, I, since my hand is not up, I'll just say um, that's actually one of the hopes that um, some of the co-defendants get um, um, an early trial, a speedy trial, sooner than later, which will give Fonnie Willis in... in um, uh, in Atlanta, the opportunity to present her case um, with these co-defendants without Trump so people can actually start to see some of the facts of actually, you know, what what was going on and what they were doing um, without, um, yeah, um, just as kind of a, so that so the strategy may be playing into her hands in a very positive way. Mm hmm interesting before before the 2016 election i read david k johnson's book the making of donald trump i think that's the title i'll look it up um unless pete beats me to it um and it was an amazing book because he's a good investigative reporter and one of the things in there is like the trump and the trump organization in 2016 had been sued over four thousand times and and it's like, you don't sue Trump lightly because he was coached by Roy Cohn, who's like, the first thing they do is they countersue. 
they 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 darken the sky with lawyers because they know that being aggressive back is a really great tactic, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, that is just astonishing to me. I was like, like who's gonna who's gonna vote for this guy? And and there were other overwhelming forces at play that meant a very slight majority of Americans did vote for that guy, and still believe it. Um, and so I'm really, I'm extremely intrigued by the interplay of facts and stories and uh and emotions and i I, unfortunately i still feel like emotions trump facts uh most of the time uh and we're doing a poor job of entering people's emotional lives in a way that they can hear and sort of engage and that that's i don't know that's that's and that's like difficult territory that we don't i think pay enough attention to because there's plenty. Like 2016, there was a great book, you know, uh, Making of Donald Trump, that had a whole bunch of facts in it that were hard, hard to like, ignore or refute, and they didn't help. Gil, go ahead. Yeah, to, Gil. Just before you jump in, to to just quickly respond to Jerry, one of the things I realized, you know, at some point in time, you know, practicing law was usually in any case, you know, you had. Uh, a, a number of irrefutable facts. And then it becomes what kind of story can you make up <laughs> around those particular irrefutable facts that at an emotional level would convince people or a judge to decide in your favor? It's not about truth or justice. Uh, that's why when I hear the word justice sometimes, I actually go a little bit um, uh, blank because the word um, doesn't have that much meaning to me from my own experience. Mm. Sorry, Gil, thank you. Okay, it's all it's all relevant. Um, gosh, um, Jerry, what do you mean they, white man? Mm. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of amused that you have the assumption that, um, that reason should trump facts uh, and, and that you're holding on to the belief that it can. So there's... A thought I've shown over and over in my brain is that uh, emotion trumps reason most of the time. So I, I'm I'm saying I am rueful. I am a rueful observer that that reason fails so, in the face of stories all the time and emotions yeah, all you're, the time. You're, 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 you, I, I get that you're rueful and you're and you're and you're um, uh, I don't know wistful. Wish it were otherwise, but it ain't. Um, the 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 David the the the, what are the four thousand lawsuits. The fascinating thing about that for me is that that wasn't covered on the mainstream media in 2016, when it might've made, had some impact. Um, um, it was in like, it was like in 17 or 18 that Michael Bloomberg um, in talking about Trump's corruption said, and, and, you know, like not just sued 4,000 times, but like, you know, decades of not paying vendors, including lawyers, as we've seen recently. Uh, and Bloomberg said, oh, everybody in New York knows that he's like that. Nobody will do business with him because everybody knows that he's like that. Of course, it's not true because people keep doing business with him for some reason. But Bloomberg never said that on the debate stage when it might have mattered. He said it afterwards. Yep. Um, Stacy, thank you for the for the, um, uh, the for the window into the bubble. Um, I'm 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 relieved that like you know my bubble is better than their bubble. I take I take comfort in that. I posted in the chat. Uh, uh, speaking of bubbles, a piece by Ben Hunt of Epsilon Theory, who's an analyst that I follow very closely these days, um, in a in a in a piece subtitle like you know, "This is guaranteed to piss everybody off on all sides," and it's talking about the the nature of the bubbles that we live in, and how we construct our narratives from within our own bubbles. And you know. Um, uh, He's trying to do something kind of even handed, which I don't expect any of us to do because we're, you know, <laughs> we're in our bubbles. So. But it's it's a very instructive read to think about how all this stuff is constructed in human society today. That's it. Thanks, Gil. Uh, Ken, is it poem time? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it could be. I also have a comment uh, that I just oh, want to make about... Um, I've now watched uh, 11 episodes of Oliver Stone's Untold History of the United States. I have to parse them out because they're so tough to watch. They just leave me feeling devastated and depressed. Um, and I'm really curious to, you know, the there have been so many moments 
in history where things could have gone a different, very different way. We'd be living in a completely different world than we're in now. And yet it just feels like the liars, the, the, the there's so much backroom backstabbing, you know, machinations going on behind the scenes, starting with how Henry Wallace was booted from the, uh, re- the democratic ticket in 1942 and replaced with Harry Truman, you know, and, and it just every single president since FDR, they, they've lied, they've cheated. And yet people, they don't understand. They don't, they don't see what's going on there. And we keep being sold the lie over and over and over again. And I'm wondering what's it going to take for you to wake up and say, you know, this is really, this will not stand. And I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing anywhere. So that's just a question on, on my mind of why do we keep having um, uh, such naivete at a collective level to be buying the lies over and over again? How do we wake up from that? Mm. Yeah, so my comment sort of addresses that because I think part of part of the problem is we don't want to be accountable when it comes to us or our side. So when I hear people you know, talking about Hunter Biden, and I point out that Ivanka was investigated, her and Donald Trump Jr. were investigated in 2012. But think about it. They made a deal with Cy Vance, who is a Democrat. So the swamp is, you know, it's bipartisan. So if we're going to look and say it's only them or it's only them, that's going to be a big problem. I do feel that Democrats are more willing to hold their own accountable, at least now in this moment in time. I can't speak of what was 10 years ago. Right now, when we, I think, when we see somebody commit a crime, even if they're Democrat, we want them held accountable. I don't see that with Republicans. There's a different kind of messed up loyalty that goes on there. There's a deep calculus of membership and loyalty that's going on. Um, We're getting uh, noise from somebody's room. Uh, Klaus, then Judy, and then we're Almost yeah, that. I wanted to to respond to this idea of people being naive, um, and and that's really also the centerpiece of the neo book where we are talking in colors, you know, in the spiral dynamic sense of colors. I mean, there is a significant share of the population that simply doesn't have the cognitive capacity, the education, the skill sets to comprehend the complexities of climate change, and this group will uh, relies on trusted sources. So the, 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 when, when someone captures you know, the trust of these groups, then they believe, right? they become believers. Trump has captured the imagination in ways that uh, whatever he says is being accepted as true. So that's not necessarily naive. That's, that's, that's really um, uh, needing to trust and needing to believe because the cognitive capacity uh, uh, and, and, and training education and all of that doesn't really allow this, this uh, group to, to have uh, a differentiated opinion. And so that's, that's the, the challenge is really that our political systems, and this is where the demagogue comes in, right? I mean, this is as old as Plato, uh, the, the Republic, where uh, the, the, the part of the population that will that that, that uh, depends on uh, um, on being guided in the, in this sense uh, is being abused and and misled uh, and we let it happen in plain sight because we look at what is being said and 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 you go how can anyone believe this well obviously you know, there are people there are groups of people who do and and I think we need to spend more time understanding why that is and how we can cut into that information stream yeah thank you uh judy then Stuart, then poem then i think we're out of this call well i won't go <clears throat> too deeply i i was catching the word discernment and to me that has a lot of meaning but it also invokes a lot of conditions to as well to be a discerning citizen or a discerning person you have to be willing to contemplate the opposite of what you want to believe because you have to look at, at multiple viewpoints. And that's challenging even to find good sources of the viewpoints 
given the nature of media and literature and hampered further by the inadequacy of the reading level and comprehension level of huge portions of the American economy where the reading level is elementary school or middle school at best. And that means that the only way information can be received is orally and orally is subject to no opportunity for discernment because you're trying to listen. And so it's a vicious circle and I'm really at a loss for how to interrupt it except to ex ask questions that force the other party to stop and think. <laughs> so I have found that questioning is really helpful and I try to do it in a constructive, help me understand given what you're saying, what you would think about X. <laughs> and it's, I try to be respectful, but it's really hard. And even as a fairly intelligent, academically well-trained person, finding good information is very hard. And you can spend a lot of time. My only trick is to look at both sides of any issue. I always search X and then I search anti X on the internet just to get a whole different sort of information. <clears throat> and I'll stop there because we could talk for hours about this. Mm. <clears throat> Thanks, Judy. Stuart, you're muted. Thank you. Um, in the world of persuasion, um, in its in its best art form, um, one it always needs to be um, um, ethical ethos. It needs to be um, rational. Um, in other words, you need to have the particular facts that allow someone to be influenced by what you have to say. But the thing that really uh, moves people are our emotions in the form of stories or poems. Um, you know, the world of, of kind of influence and, and, and persuasion. Um, and, and speaking to, to, to what you just mentioned, Judy, I think it's just really important. There's a, 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 a well-respected guru named Sadhguru um, that a lot of people I have respect for, you know, follow. And I've never been able to quite get into his um, oral presentations, his lectures, but I've recently gotten into one of his books about karma. And the, the guy is really brilliant. There's a reason he has this huge um, following and I'll follow up um, um, with his book about inner engineering, because I'm curious about what he has to say around that. I wanted to read a quick quote because it was it's been mentioned on the call that a lot of people here are writing and um uh it had nothing to do with with a book I wrote but but I've put it in the book and I think it's it's an unknown quote. We write because we have to say what we believe. We discover what we what we believe because we write. All else of writing is but a searching for form style technique to show those beliefs in an acceptable artistic manner. When we succeed, our hearts are on the stage to touch the hearts and minds of the audiences. It is an awesome experience. Thanks, Stuart. Um, Michael, and then we'll go to Ken because you haven't stepped into the conversation yet. This call and I'm happy you're Jumping in. Hey, um, I just got to a place where I was actually able to, to talk. Um, really appreciated all the check ins today. And um, uh, I was struck by what Judy was was, um, was talking about and something Stacy had brought up earlier just about, um, you know, triangulating positions, um, uh, discussing what is true um, or at least perceived as true. And and um, I was struck by what um, Judy said about uh, looking up X and looking up anti-X um, and that the, the duality of um, of every conversation in this country and the the categorization into red position and blue position 
are hugely problematic in problem solving here. And, and the toughest thing is like to get between X and anti X um, to like any kind of solution that, you know, it just the conversations that we need to have with people to draw out their key key stuck places outside of the context of I'm anti-X or I'm pro-X, but rather to say, what is it about X that you're anti and what is it about X you're pro? And sometimes it's just that it's associated with my team or it's not, which is, you know, painful, but in a way easy to, easier to deal with. And sometimes it's something like, you know, I mean, I, I always like go to abortion, which seems so polarizing. And if you're if you think abortion is murder and if you think it's a woman woman's right to choose. Those are those are two polar opposites, but the solution to both of them is for women not to need to choose abortion, which means the thing that everybody should be uniting behind is better early childhood care, better, you know, economic circumstances, you know, all the things that together would accomplish both of these polar opposites. Um, and, and I feel like every issue is like that. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm speechifying and that, and that, you know, I think my point is made, but um, it's not, it's not anti-X and pro-X. It's just like, let's really understand X. Um, anyway, that's all. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Um, Adam Grant offers a useful term, complexification. And he says, sometimes in these issues that look really binary, the thing to do is to sort of peel them apart and to see their, compl their fuller complexity and then talk through the different parts together because you don't disagree on all the parts usually. Um, Ken. So I'll, I'll <clears throat> read something I actually wrote about 16 years ago. And Homer original. And Homer original. So if war worked, we'd have peace by now. Perhaps it's time to try something different. Here's some things from my list. What's on yours? Let's use our intelligence for life. Let's speak words for healing, not hating. Let's try thinking with our hearts and feeling with our minds. Let's focus our gaze on the horizon and then turn towards each other and inquire into what we see together. Let's attune our ears to the echoes of our grandparents' love as we listen to the laughter of our grandchildren. Let's make sure we include infants and our elders when we need to make important decisions. Let's feel the earth flowing through us in each moment that we breathe, eat, labor, love, rest, and dream. And let's align our current ego systems to harmonize with the Earth's, the Earth's ancient ecosystems. That's from October 21st, 2007. Sweet. Published Thank somewhere? You. Published somewhere, Ken? Uh, you heard it here first, folks. So it's really beautiful. On my hard drive. <laughs> I, I assume you'll share, you'll share it to the list. I'll share it to the list. Don't don't be shy, Ken. I think you have you have treasures in uh, under your couch that need to be seen by more people. I encourage the cushions. <laughs> might be some spare change there too. You know. Yeah. Right. Who knows? And you know, in moving, you might discover. I might. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> anyway. uh, thank you very I, much. That's great. Yeah. One of my favorite Gandhi lines is. Um, if we keep on living uh, in, in the mantra of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, we'll be living in an eyeless and toothless world. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. It's been a lovely OGM-ish moment. Bye-bye. See ya. See you on the tubes. <laughs>